Thank you very much for that, Sayyid Muhammad Murtava Naqvi, for the very insightful and enriching discussion on the concept of sharing. I'm sure there's at least one or two points we can all take home from this insightful speech. Because indeed, the month of Ramadan is not just a month in which we stay away from food and water and other physical needs. No, the month of Ramadan is, a bit, is much more than that. The month of Ramadan is a month for us all to refocus our attention to God, towards God, and to, and to be able to practice discipline and self-sacrifice. Ramadan is indeed a month to share the richness which has been given to us by God to the rest of his creations. Through fasting, to some extent, we taste the suffering and pain of those who are poor and destitute. Fasting teaches us indeed empathy and sympathy, and it takes away some of our selfishness and self-centeredness. I would now like to take the opportunity to invite one of our esteemed guests to the podium with the following introduction. Professor Richard Bonney was the lecturer in European history at the University of Reading between 1971 and 1984, and professor of modern history at the University of Leicester between 1984 and 2006. In 1997, he was ordained as a non stipendiary priest in the Church of England, and since 2008 has been the priest and in charge of the Saint of the Saint Guthlock's Church in Knighton. He has researched interfaith relations in the multicultural city of Leicester since 1996 and has been well known to many of the faith communities for over 20 years or so since he has started working on the subject. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Richard Bunny through our traditional means by sending blessings on the family of Muhammad and his progeny through a loud salawat. Good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum to you. I can't uh, hope to match the eloquence and erudition of our previous speaker, uh, but I hope you will find some of these words of interest. It's a very great pleasure to have been invited to join your big iftar and to bring some of members of my own congregation, St. Guthlack, is a difficult saint, nobody's ever heard of him, but he was actually a very important saint, but before the time of the Norman Conquest, so that was quite a long time ago. Uh, we very much hope on a later occasion that some members of this mosque will join us at a comparable sort of event at St. Guthlac's Church. We don't have a big iftar, but we can think of something a bit like it, perhaps. It's also a very great honor to have been invited to say a few words, and my, I think my words will actually chime in very much with um, our learned scholars' uh, in, um, coverage of the whole issue of giving. But before I move to my theme, I'm speaking now perhaps more as a historian. I'd just like to say that this meeting, because it is a meeting of, of Shia Muslims and eight Christians who've come, been invited by you, uh, in Leicester comes at a momentous time. We each have had reasons to mourn as a result of murderous attacks on our co-religionists in recent weeks. In your case, we grieve with your community worldwide at the attack on the Imam Sadiq Mosque in Kuwait, with its 227 wounded people and at least 27 killed. This monstrous attack was launched while the community were at prayer so it was a supreme act of blasphemy as well. And it's not the first of its type in the Middle East. There have been two in Saudi Arabia, I believe. There have been attacks in Pakistan on your community as well. As Christians, we deplore each and every atrocity of this kind 
wherever it takes place in the world and against whichever community of believers. Of course, this country, being an island, is somewhat insular in its attitudes, and the main preoccupation of the media has not been with what happened uh, to the Shia community, but with the loss of life on the beach and at the hotel at Sous in Tunisia. Ended up with slightly more casualties in terms of the deceased, but what does the actual number matter? What difference does it make? The loss of one life is too many, as the Holy Quran states in, uh, in Surah 5, Ayat uh, 32. We ordain for the children of Israel that anyone slew a person, unless it be for a murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. Very few people in the West realize that by far, by far the greater loss of life in the war on terror has been felt by Muslims themselves in Muslim-majority countries. And that's a fact which I've been trying to make people understand in the Western world. With a, with a modicum of success, but I don't blow my trumpet on something where it's very, very difficult to make a headway against the blast of the media perception. These introductory comments might seem a long way from my subject, which is charity and sharing with humanity. But you can't have a sense of humanity unless you have a sense of the dignity of mankind. And the loss of life in senseless killing in those two incidents I've just described, is a loss of humanity for all of us. I want to draw a few links between the faiths of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam by suggesting to you something which I come across on a website. I don't think the story itself is particularly authentic, but the theme, I believe, is the concept of Abrahamic generosity. It does not appear in the Holy Quran so much as in some oral traditions about Abraham. And I came across a Muslim writer who, who recalls this. At a very early age, I was taught stories of Abraham the patriarch, who was such a generous person that he wouldn't have his meal if there were no visitors to invite. My grandmother used to tell us, possibly with some level of exaggeration, that Abraham used to wait for days at the crossroads in front of his house in order to find a passerby to invite to his table. If nobody passed by the road, he would ask that the table be cleaned without touching the food, she used to say. In the Hebrew scriptures, which are the starting point for Judaism and Christianity, a specific story is linked with Abraham's generosity. It comes from the first book of Moses, the Torah, which is called Genesis, chapter 18. And it goes like this. It has an element of mystery about it. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my lords, actually in the Christian tradition, it's always my lord for some reason, even though there are three people who appear. My lords, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour. Knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that had, he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Note he didn't join them, he stood by them. He was the host showing the generosity, but he wasn't lording it over his guests. 
his guests were the Lord's. And my Muslim writer remarks on this theme of Abrahamic generosity. One cannot understand Muslims during Ramadan waking up in the middle of the night and receiving guests for a meal without this sort of idea being present in the faith. In this modern age, he adds, we don't wait for people to pass by. We make our plans beforehand. That's what you've done tonight with your big iftar. And uh, have as many guests as you can, but never alone. Various phrases come to mind from titles of Christian books which seem applicable to this story. Ideas such as the generosity of God, the kindness of God, the hospitality of God. And we find such phrases in the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, saying, feed the hungry, pay a visit to the sick, and free the captives. Words that are also in the Hebrew Scriptures and in the Christian New Testament. Jesus says this, these words, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to, play, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free. And his great commandment. The most important commandment, he said, is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Or as the prophet, peace be upon him, is reported to have said, whoever believes in God in the last day should be generous to his neighbor. But the only question that I'm left with, but which Jesus gives me an answer to, but in a sense it's been anticipated already in the earlier uh, address, is the definition, who is my neighbor? It's all very easy if my neighbor is the person who's like me. So, from my point of view, if he's a Christian, or from your point of view, if he's a Muslim. It's much more difficult if my neighbor is actually somebody who's quite different from me, whose views I understand and respect, but don't actually espouse. And Jesus has a teaching on this, which I think is very helpful and has been very influential in this Christian tradition. And it's the story which is called the Good Samaritan. And I don't want to tell it because it's quite long in detail, but just the outline of it. Good Samaritan is the wrong title. It should be Compassionate Samaritan. The reason it's, he's called the Good Samaritan is that Jews didn't like Samaritans, full stop. And they didn't believe Samaritans were capable of doing anything good for other people. They just assumed they were a bad lot who hadn't quite got the true faith. So, a man traveling along the road from Jerusalem to, Jeric from Jerusalem to Jericho, he's beaten up. He is robbed of everything. He's left at death's door. Two devout Jews pass by. They don't help the man. There are various reasons why they might not have helped the man, but the important thing is they put those reasons first. The third person to come by is a Samaritan. The last person you would a Jew would have expected, a Jew at that time would have expected to show compassion for the man. But he is the one who helps him. He is the one who puts him on his uh, own uh, um, donkey, takes him to uh, uh, um, a local um, well, uh, traveler's inn, or whatever existed exactly at that time, and also pays the innkeeper to look after the man until he comes back again. And if he hasn't got enough money, he will pay him more when he returns. The Samaritan saw his neighbor as anyone who was in need. Jesus tells his questioner, who was a Jewish lawyer, to go and do likewise. In other words, we are to love others regardless of their race or their religion. The criterion is need. If there is a person in need, we have more than the bare sufficiency. 
then we are to give generously and freely without expectation of return and whether or not they are our co-religionists. And that's precisely, I believe, the point that my brother made earlier. I'd like to illustrate this, actually, with a, a, a recent event held at the St. Philip's Center. It was a big collection of toys for the children of Syria who have lost everything. Many of them, of course, have lost their homes. They've been forcibly moved. They are refugees with little hope of return from that dreadful conflict. It was a toy collection, and the collection was donated with considerable generosity from the various faith communities of Leicester. Not Muslims giving the collection on their own, but Muslims supported by all the other faith communities. And as I said, in, in considerable generosity. It was packed up by members of the different faiths working side by side, and finally it was delivered by those who had established networks with other agencies in Syria who could distribute the toy parcels. This is just one aspect of the joy, I believe, of Leicester and an example of joint faith enterprise cutting across religious boundaries. It's a marvelous example. I'd like to draw uh, to a close by telling you about one other, but before I do, I just wanted to uh, go back to those words of Jesus about loving God. He says, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And I want to focus for a moment on mind. My church, at the moment, in collaboration with the progressive Jewish community, organizes two memory cafes, as they're called, for those who are suffering from memory loss and also for their carers. Initially, it was supported by the Near Neighborhood Fund to try to get the message understood by the rest of the communities in Leicester where there are some cultural barriers. The word dementia has a resonance sometimes with uh, people from uh, other cultures and particularly in languages where uh, there isn't a precise translation of the term uh, dementia um, so that it might appear that it's an Ill, um, uh, um, um, going mad rather than an illness that we are talking about. And it may carry a social stigma but irreversible memory loss is not going mad. It is a progressive condition that can affect people at all ages. It can happen very early in life, and it's very widespread among older people. About a third of the population of Leicester is expected to have this condition within 20 years, <coughs> certainly if the research doesn't produce some good results. And it is woefully inadequate, the care that is provided in the community at the moment. So we have to self-help, essentially. And what we have done, therefore, is to provide for carers and um, those they care for the necessary information, contacts, and friendship, companionship, sharing of food, sharing of games, sharing of memories from the past, which can help them uh, enjoy part of their lives. So it is possible to have this condition and for certainly until it becomes very serious to uh, actually live a reasonably happy life. Because isolation, being imprisoned as it were, those things that uh, we actually would fight against in physical terms, we aren't I think aware enough of them in mental terms. So we want to expand our network with the various faith communities in order to raise awareness of this growing issue of memory loss, to gain support of the faith communities. And if you are interested, please collect a leaflet or ask um, your wife, if she's uh, next door, to collect a leaflet, because I think my, my wife is holding all the leaflets at the moment. We have them in English, Arabic, Urdu, and Somali. We haven't got them in Farsi, I'm afraid, but... Uh, you know, these are done by the uh, Alzheimer's Society. Remember, I've also said to you, I'm hoping that I will see some of you again at uh, St. Guthlac's Church for an event with hospitality. 
I thank you again for your generous welcome and hospitality this evening. We greatly, uh, as Christians, we greatly admire your commitment to prayer and almsgiving in Ramadan, which is a great example for us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor, for that lovely speech. Um, the end is near. Um, the all advertised time for the Big Iftar is finally upon us. Um, just before the Big Iftar table is laid out in the center, we will break for prayers um, where you're all joined and welcome to observe. On behalf of, the, on behalf of, of our respected Sheikh Yusuf Ali Dirani and the community of Muslim Shia in Leicester, we thank you so much for taking the time to come and joining us in our joy and in our iftar. Just after the prayers, um, there will be a thank you note by the president of our community, Brother Muhammad Sadiq Rajani, and then we will have the iftar. Thank you very much. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima